Today we've got a malicious compliance that caused thousands in car damages. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, I cost the company a 10,000 fine for delaying our outbound flight. Many years ago, I worked for one of the largest overnight package delivery services. I was efficient at my job and followed all the rules. At the time, we were focused on expanding our international business. Due to individual country customs laws, we had a handbook showing all requirements for a particular country. This made processing international, non-document shipments extremely time-consuming. One particular day, pre-internet and cell phone, I'm working my regular route. My onboard computer, which gives me my work orders for pickup, starts beeping like it's malfunctioning. 2 p.m. I look at the screen and all of my work is getting reassigned. After clearing the message buffer, one stop, one mile away and not part of my route, pops up. It's for 125 four foot long rolled up billboards going to all parts of Europe for a movie premiere. I call my dispatcher and tell her, what the heck? Why'd you give me a bulk stop on Mr. Lazy Butt's route? Why can't he do it? Her answer, you know he always refuses to work late. I tell her, send me back my route and find someone else. She said my boss told her to give it to me. Not usually true, but it was her standard response. I call my boss, he confirms. Mind you, I still had deliveries to finish. This bulk stop will take a minimum of two to three hours to process solo, so I tell my boss I can't do it on time on site and get back to the hub in time. He says there's nobody else available, do the best you can. I finish my deliveries and arrive at around three at the location. The shipper hands me a stack of waybills and points to the pile of the rolls on the floor. I was pissed before I arrived. Now I'm fuming. I call my dispatcher requesting backup. Same response. No one's available, but I'll try to get you someone. Never got the backup. I hang up and start mumbling, this is BS, so customer can't hear me. We're required to process packages at the customer location. This is necessary in case of errors or missing paperwork. Our delivery guarantees kick in as soon as we take packages off the customer location. Each of these packages is worth over $100 in shipping revenue, $15,000 approximately. Cue malicious compliance, so I get to work. At 5 p.m., I'm not even half done. I load everything in my truck, drive back to the hub, and contact the manager on duty. I dump the entire shipment on the floor as instructed. Ten co-workers descend on the pile. Boss says I can go home. I do my closeout routine, 20 minutes. I walk past the swarm of co-workers processing the pile. The next morning, I get called into the hub manager's office. She asks what happened. I explain as I did above. She says that the client was so important that they made our plane wait an extra 30 minutes, costing us $10,000 and that she had to write me up. I responded, I followed all company policies and was instructed by my direct boss to do my best. I did just that. I don't believe it's fair to get punished for working as directed. She looks at me and says, You're right. You can go. Just make sure there is no next time. No write up. It was policy to process packages on the site. However, for bulk stops, it was normally allowed to take them back unprocessed despite policy. I chose to hold the cargo. This was after years of getting forced to do work that Mr. Lazy Butt refused to do. This was the last time they did it to me. We were bound by the Department of Transportation rules. I was approaching my hours limit, which is why I was told to leave once I returned to the hub. Violations of those rules could result in huge fines and an automatic write-up, so I complied with the strictest policy. My malice is in that I could have just loaded my truck and gone back with nothing processed. I would have still have had to have processed the cargo, but would probably have gotten help sooner with no flight delay. I knew I couldn't do it alone in two hours. My boss was a jerk who played favorites with Mr. Lazybutt. This was the last straw. I followed procedure to the point that it conflicted with more serious policies that could have gotten me fired. I know people who work in a similar type company, and I always hear about rescues and whatnot where you have to help out with missed deliveries and whatnot, but to think that somebody can get by in a job like this by being lazy and just dumping the hard workloads off on other people? I just wonder, like, what level of nepotism or, like, buddy-buddy-ship do they have with the dispatcher people to be able to pull a stun like this? Are they that short of workers? Also, hi, 
I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story is, you need to think long and hard about whether you want this job. Okay. Context. I work in IT in a very small area where everybody knows each other in one way or another, so networking with people is very important. I got a new job in a private school, partly because I knew the consultant acting as hiring manager at that time, but also because he knew I had skills in Azure and its many cloud components, which was the direction he envisioned the school going. Great stuff, I can do the migration no problem, as I've gone through it twice at previous companies. I started just before the summer holidays, which were 9 weeks at the school, gosh darn that sounds bliss, so I spent a bit of time getting to grips with the equipment, network and just generally settling in. It was a small team of myself, 2 desktop guys, 1 part time, and the consultant slash manager who worked 3 part days, usually about 10am to 2-3pm. to 3 PM. After about three months, the school hired a permanent manager and dropped the consultant after he had handed over all of his responsibilities. Things continued as normal. I worked away on getting the prerequisites in place while juggling some other projects like managed printing and network upgrades. Everything seemed great, although I was being pulled away from my cloud tasks more than I'd like, but figured it was just how things were here with such a small team. Jump forward to December, my 6 month probation was due, so I asked the manager, let's call her D, when we could have a meeting to discuss how things have been and sign off on my probation. She kept putting it off with generic excuses, and it ended up happening in mid-January where she absolutely destroyed me. Instead of talking to me like a reasonable human being, she held up all these microaggressions and spent over 30 minutes unloading them onto me absolutely crushing my motivation. She also said she doesn't believe the cloud is the right way to go, lol, and that I needed to be better at on-premise infrastructure and networking. I had specifically said during my interviews that networking is my weakest area and that I specialize in cloud computing. So essentially the role I'm supposed to be doing has changed entirely to one that I'm not good at. She used this as a way to suggest extending my probation while she creates a new role for me that's more fitting as I don't have the networking skills she was looking for. I was visibly upset and she left me for a minute, but just before she left she said, You need to think long and hard about if you want this job because right now you're not performing well enough to keep it. I sat there for about 20 minutes, alone in a side room near our office. Thoughts went through my head doubting myself worrying about losing my apartment I bought just 6 months ago if I lost this job, worrying what my family would think and just generally how I'd feel with what I felt was an inevitability. I tried my best with everything I did and she still wasn't happy. So I thought about what she said, do I want this job? No. So that night I signed up with all my local job agencies, frequently checked job sites and all the time I was at work. I acted like she'd helped me see my errors and that I was working on them to prove myself to her. Actually, I hated her guts and couldn't stand being in the same room as her. I hadn't taken any of my annual leave days as I had no money after spending all my savings on my apartment, so I didn't see the point in taking time off to sit around. She nagged me constantly about this, saying I'd lose it if it wasn't taken, blah blah blah. Like I didn't already know how holidays work? I booked a big block of three weeks at the end of May, as we had family coming to visit. This is relevant later. About two months later, I booked a couple days holiday to attend an interview. Obviously, I just told her I fancied a long weekend. I got the job. Not only was it more engaging and relevant to my area of expertise, but it was a tasty 7,000 pay rise with a bonus scheme up to 25% annually. Sweet. I come back in on Monday ready to hand in my notice, but she's booked a meeting with me while I was off for 10am to discuss my new role. I have my notice in an envelope and bring that to the meeting. She starts with pretty much saying, you've gotten a bit better but still not good enough for this job so I'd like to propose. I cut her off and hand her the envelope. She opens it, reads it and says, oh, okay, um, huh. She says, okay, well your notice period is a month, so your final day will be the 8th of June. I counter with, actually I think you'll find that while on my probation period, it's actually only two weeks. 
which brings it to the 25th of May, which is also a public holiday, as is the 24th. So my last day is actually the 23rd of May. She tries to say I'd passed probation, but I remind her of the letter I signed agreeing to the extension, and that I hadn't signed any contract for this new role yet. A bit of back and forth, and she finally concedes. I also remind her that I'd had almost the entirety of my annual leave, which has to be paid to me when I leave, as my finish date was before they were to be taken. As the school was going through a big cost-saving exercise, this would look really bad on her. She asked me to take them instead of working my notice, which I declined. I'd rather tolerate her for 8 more days and get paid for a full month's pay on top of my normal salary. She reluctantly agreed and said she's going to talk to HR and let them know. On the way out of the meeting, I thanked her for helping me out in January. She looked at me confused, so I reminded her that I needed to think long and hard about whether I wanted this job, and I decided that no, I didn't, and found a much better package elsewhere. Now I have my own office, complete with coffee machine and mini fridge, staff who work with me on projects, and time to work on Azure features like I'm supposed to, all while getting paid considerably more. Thanks, D. P.S. She got the boot three months after I left. Apparently she clashed with a lot of the teaching staff with their management style. Guess I wasn't the only one who didn't get on with her. The best bad manager stories are definitely the ones like OPs here, where the managers were so bad, they inspired them to do better for themselves. And not only did they try to do better, they did do better for themselves. Our next story is, no water, no work. My former employer was a quite large metal treatment company, and as you can imagine, it's hard, hot, and heavy work. Well, the manager of this factory, I can only assume he has the world's tiniest junk and feels the need to stamp his authority whenever he gets a chance. His number two is the lapdog type who just blindly follows what the big boss says even if it's an awful idea. I have way too many stories of ridiculous things that went on in my time there. Anyway, as usual at this place, we all get pulled into the break room for a briefing. Basically just where we all get told how rubbish we are and all the wonderful things the company does for us. His best example was, like making sure we all get paid, to which my response was, well if he didn't, we wouldn't be here. So how is that doing such a great thing for us? This particular week, we're told for some reason that we have no respect for the facilities and keeping things lean because we have our water bottles put on the various desks throughout the shop floor. We ask for a designated place to put them then, to which we're told it's now a health and safety issue. So we all go back and forth questioning whether we're allowed to drink water on shift. Obviously the boss and his lapdog see this is completely not allowed. So they say, oh no, but you have to go to the break room to get a drink if you're feeling thirsty. Very well. Every single one of us on shift will go to the break room to get a drink of water whenever we're feeling dehydrated. I was the supervisor at the time and got the other two supervisors on board with me. So told all of the guys that every one of them had to go get a drink at least once every 30 minutes to make sure they weren't dehydrated in this dangerous environment totaling about 14 or 15 drink breaks per man minimum, each taking approximately 5 minutes by the time they leave their station and return, losing over an hour of production per man. Well, obviously this had a major impact on the productivity of the line. By the second day, I was pulled aside by the lapdog and told the guys were taking the piss. I responded, well, they're only being reasonable and looking after their own health and safety. That's what you want, isn't it? You don't want someone passing out and causing an accident, do you? This continued for another three days or so, before there was not only a complete U-turn of the drinks bottle situation, but we used it to get the company to install water machines on every station in the factory. Apparently, the so-called health and safety issue was no longer an issue. In the end, the big boss's tiny ego cost the company tens of thousands in production and thousands in water machine installations. You know, most managers or bosses or supervisors in this position would be able to see both A, the humane thing, which is allowing you access to water immediately, and B, the reasonable thing, where obviously you're going to want to drink water quite a bit in that place, and it makes no sense to keep taking breaks left and right. 
I think while all those water machine installations are great, this manager should have gotten fired on top of that. Our next story is 32 cheeseburgers and a free Philly cheesesteak. Since we're sharing our McDonald's experiences, here's mine. I worked at a small-ish McDonald's in and around 2005, which was situated in the parking lot of a big box store complex. I covered mainly lunch shifts during the summer before transitioning to night shifts after school started back up. I hated all the other part-timers because they were lazy butts, while the lunch crew were a bunch of retired old ladies who needed extra money for bridge gambling. But that's another story. It was a rainy Tuesday when a guy wearing a blue and red jacket stormed in and ordered 32 cheeseburgers. If you've ever worked in fast food, you know that the fryer, flat top grill, is only so big. You can fry, grill, about 12 regular burger patties at once if you absolutely jam them in there. But at the McDonald's I worked at, we segregated our fryers. So we had one dedicated to chicken and fish products, one dedicated to meats, and a third of the meat fryer, also called the flat top grill, was dedicated to no salt and pepper. Normally burgers come with salt and pepper put on during the frying process, but some people who frequented our store were allergic. So we had a separate off area for that. This meant we could only do eight patties at a time. To further cause issue, this guy arrived in the middle of our dinner rush. So we already had orders frying up and our stock of existing burgers was already out. I'm in the kitchen and I immediately threw more burgers on the fryer, but after that it was just a waiting game. I can hear this irate burger man ranting at the staff. Our manager would have beat his butt if she'd been there, but we only had a supervisor and after the man made her cry, I, as the most experienced worker on shift, stepped in to keep things going. I went out front and told the man that we were making the burgers as fast as we could, but obviously there are limits. Limits he told us to freak ourselves with. He then went on a rant about how he needs these burgers to feed his kids soccer team and they're waiting in the bus for their dinner. I indicated that we do catering orders, but we have a phone number precisely for that. He continued to rant at me about how he needed his burgers now and we should have just had already 32 burgers already cooked and ready because didn't we know that sometimes people just need 32 burgers and blah blah blah. So I went back and made his burgers, loaded them all up and handed them over. He took the burgers and then fixed me with a smirk and went, where's my Philly cheesesteak? This was at the time we had a deli counter, something that has long since been phased out. This ingrate did not order a Philly cheesesteak, and we both knew it, but he kept circling back to a the customer's always right comment and demanded he had, and we'd just forgotten it and he demanded that he must get his cheesesteak that he didn't pay for. He threatened that he'd demand his money back if we didn't give him his cheesesteak. Alright, fine. I was the only one in the store who could make deli sandwiches. It was super simple. Everyone else was just inept or lazy or both. Normally we take two buns, run them through the toaster, throw on lettuce, take a packet of pre-mixed Philly cheesesteak, put it in the microwave, nuke it for two minutes and drop it on top, sauce it and go. This time I went through all the steps without nuking it, wrapped it all up nicely and handed it off to the guy without a smile. I even heated the bun like normal so it just looked like a regular Philly but the meat and cheese were an ice cold brick. The guy headed off jauntily, got into his bus and presumably distributed his cheeseburgers and then drove off. I headed to the back to see how the supervisor was getting on. Better, but she wanted to go home for the night. Now, while I was senior in the sense that I took on a lot of responsibility and had experience with this kind of stuff, I was actually quite new to that store. I just had a reputation for not taking crap and being responsible, so I wasn't actually authorized to close the store. Still, I conferred with the other staff, we rang up the actual manager, and got approval to close early. So we get everything ready and done, pack up and begin closing up the front, and the bus and a very angry man in a red and blue jacket pull in. He practically leaps down from the bus and races across the parking lot towards our door, at which point I smile at him, lock the door, and turn the open sign off, then close the blinds and we all filed out the back. He was still beating on the door as we got into our cars and left. 
honestly, I think if you're ordering anything more than like six to eight burgers, you probably do want to call it ahead. Or at least like do an online order or something. Something that gives them, you know, some kind of leeway or buffer time. You can't just like show up and expect 32 burgers to just be like phased into existence. Like they've got some magic Star Trek beam back there just beaming burgers in left and right. Our next story is, we can't refund you. Trying to return or exchange a rather large item that costs about 280 bucks to Marber Freight in the tool area. I let them know that I just didn't have a need for it. I had my receipt. I promise I was a decent man about this. I didn't see the sign when I asked her if I could return my item. She decided she wasn't having it today and sharply and rapidly tapped on the plexiglass and level of body odor that separated us. She got super stern and said, no refunds unless there's something wrong with the item. The lady wouldn't budge on her ironclad sharpie written sign saying, no exchanges, no refunds unless there's a problem. Very vague sign that allowed for malicious compliance. She started looking around me to the next customer as if I wasn't there. I thought on my feet and stepped in her view again like I'm guarding that Euro-stepping man from Greece. Ma'am, so you're saying that something has to be wrong with it, so should I break it or draw on it with that sharpie? She says, don't be a flipping idiot, you know what the sign means. I really didn't have the patience for this, so I put the finishing move on by saying to the person behind me, hey, it says I can't return this unless there's a problem. If I don't leave right now, would that be a problem? Customer 2 behind me picked up on it pretty quickly by saying, Oh yeah, that'll be a problem. Looks like there's a problem, she said it loud enough for customer service lady to hear that. I turned back to the customer service lady and said, yeah, there's a problem. She ripped down her sign, looked at the third person entering the line, and decided to spend the remaining 1% of our time together returning the item. I went on my merry way. I know I was a bit of a jerk, but this place's customer service department is programmed to be as unwilling to work with us as possible. That was glaringly evident over the three years I've been shopping here. Let's be real here, the real problem here was probably this lady is the one that has to like take the inventory and restock it or process it or lug it around god forbid. This absolute grouch probably just didn't want to get up from the seat. This next story is, rude shopper wants a cake, instead he gets karma. I'm a cake decorator for my local grocery store. It's a fun job, if a little hectic at times. My store is located in a small town, which means I don't usually need to deal with all the more terrible customers you typically get at stores in larger cities. This town has been steadily growing though, so a lot of new people are here. My store is also the best place in town to go get a cake and I've spent the last several years of my life getting us that reputation. It's extremely rare for me to have a customer complain about a cake that I prepare or customize, which is why this encounter sticks out so much. One other thing to note, while we don't have quite as much of them here, I've been in the industry long enough to have absolutely no patience with customers if they're rude or insulting, and as you probably have guessed, this is very relevant. Anyways, today I'm at my station preparing some cakes to stock in our case when this guy comes up to me to have me personalize a cake where we put custom writing on that they ask for. We'll call him Dave. Once he's chosen the cake he wants, Dave hands it over to me to add the writing, which I promptly do. My typical style is a form of stylized cursive that looks very nice atop a cake. I never get complaints about it. I leave the cake on the counter for him to pick up once I'm done and return to what I was doing before he picks up his cake. Just another sale, I say to myself, until I see him walking back to the counter. I ask him if there's an issue. Dave's response is, no one can read what it says and it looks bad. It doesn't. And he wants me to rewrite the message. I say, okay, I'll need to scrape the top of the cake and that'll damage the top. I was about to tell him I would need a couple minutes to fix it up, but as he would have you know, Dave doesn't have time for any shenanigans from anyone and he cuts me off. Now Dave says he doesn't want the cake, and he'll pick another one and have that one written on. I roll my eyes internally and ask him which one he wants. He hands me the second cake, which I was planning to write on in a very legible print font, like you see here, but before I can get to work on the cake, he says and I quote, Get me someone who can spell. As you wish, master. 
My patience with Dave was completely gone by this point. I tell him to go to the front and ask for our assistant store leader, Antoinette, and she can help him. A bit later, I see our front end manager, Donna, who helps us out on occasion when we get behind, coming over to help Dave. Now, Donna is not a decorator, nor is Antoinette, and I never intended to get Donna involved, but that was out of my hands as my other helper was out on break at the time, and I wasn't pulling him back because of one customer being dumb. I apologized later, I had no intention of embarrassing her. She can write on cakes, but she's much slower than me and all I was trying to do at this point was waste a bit of his time because he was rude to me. He explains what he wants, and I explain why she's doing it and not myself. Since he was so insistent on not wanting my help anymore, I'm not helping him anymore. Donna writes the message on the cake and he heads off again. But then, a few minutes later, Donna comes back with the absolute best case of unintentional cathartic irony. One of the words was misspelled. So now Dave is complaining again and wants the cake fixed again. We do our best to remove the misspelled word, but as I explained before, there's going to be a bit of damage to the top. Sure enough, there was a bit of residue left over from the writing, which is completely impossible to get off, not without re-icing the cake. It's doable, as I was trying to explain to him at one point, but, well, we never got that far. Anyway, since we were unable to get that little bit of residue off, of course he doesn't want the cake anymore, and goes to complain to Antoinette. Now Antoinette is in my back room asking what the deal is. I now explain to her what's going on. Rolling her own eyes, internally, she's a good person. She starts dabbing at the cake with a paper towel, trying again to get the residue off. When she too realizes that it's not possible, she goes to tell the customer that we can't get it off, and he can either take the blemished cake with the corrected writing, or pick another one. Dave is not offered a discount as this whole issue was caused because he didn't like my styling and he never gave me a chance to correct it myself before dismissing me as incompetent. So technically no one did anything wrong. We were only doing exactly what he asked us to do after all. Fallout, Dave ended up getting a third cake out of the case, not getting it personalized, and storming off muttering furiously to himself. No one got in trouble. Everyone in the room could recognize the guy was being unreasonable. I later fixed the other cakes he had us wreck and returned them to the case. I couldn't make out what he was saying, but I did know this. This guy had just spent 15 minutes trying to bully us into giving him the perfect cake to his tastes. It was way beyond what we usually deal with, only to walk away with nothing but a face full of karma. And it was completely his own fault. The only thing that would make this story better was if this guy was insistent on a spelling that was incorrect and they were blowing up because of that. Also, it's hilarious that this guy basically just admitted to everybody they can't read cursive. And like OP said, it was probably the easy cursive to read. Our next story is thousands of euros for the damaged car. In my home country, living abroad now, the gas station have people who will fill up your tank for you. It's not optional. These people are paid to put fuel in your tank. That's it. I was one of them during my college years. The fuel we had at the station was unleaded Benson 95, 98, and 100, and diesel. One day, a regular customer came over. He was a taxi driver. I'd seen him before, both with his taxi car, a Mercedes, and his private car, an Audi. The Mercedes was a diesel car, and the Audi was Benson. Keep in mind, back then, Every taxi in the country was running with diesel. That day, he came with the taxi. I've noticed he was a bit out of it, but didn't comment on it. I asked how much he wants in the tank. He said full, unleaded 100. I looked at him strangely. You mean diesel? He said no, I mean unleaded 100. I said, but sir, you have the... I didn't get the chance to point out he was driving his taxi. He goes, young girl, please, I know what fuel my car needs. I looked at him one more time. I was getting pissed at that point. Okay, sir, full tank unleaded 100, is that correct? He said yes, thank you. Right away. And I proceeded to put unleaded 100 in his diesel car. He paid and left. Two days later, he comes again on my shift with his Audi this time. I go out to greet him, trying not to laugh at his face. What's it gonna be today, sir? Diesel? I asked, trying to bite my tongue. He eyed me carefully. Unleaded 100, please, full tank. I said, are you sure? I asked and he side-checked his car. 
Yes, thank you. I said, right away, sir. I fill his tank, and as he was paying, he adds, Next time, I would appreciate it if he told me I was being an idiot and put in the correct gas on the tank. He said it seriously, but I could see the humor in his eyes. Was the damage that much, I asked? He groaned, You have no idea. Have a good day. And he left. I never found out what was the cost of the damage, but for my duration at that gas station, when I was the one loading his car, he would always go like, Full tank, please. I can only imagine the internal pain but also satisfaction because of being frustrated that OP had when filling this diesel car full of unleaded 100. At least this guy didn't like pull back up just to like witch out OP like they owned it. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another absolutely awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.